live. This is the Jeff Santos Show on the Revolution Radio Network. Rebuilding America together. Now, here's Jeff. It is indeed the uh, Jeff Santos Show that you are tuned into. Every Monday through Friday, 3 to 6 Eastern Time, 12 to 3 Pacific Time, and of course on in Wisconsin at 92.7 FM, uh, Mike Crute's uh, great uh, AM-FM combo there. Uh, we're on 7 to 10 Central Time on replay. Um, and check it out, folks. It's a great, great place. You can also check out Revolution Radio Network for all the shows. We're on a 24-hour clock, so at 6 o'clock we repeat uh, the show at 3 o'clock Eastern Time and go right from there. Let's travel out to the Pacific Northwest where they're getting ready to in, uh, get a hockey team to play in the uh, fall. Let's see where our renaissance man, who I think is going to turn into a hockey fan one of these days, he is the great Mark Taylor Canfield, and he joins us on the line. Uh, happy Friday, Mark. How are you today? I'm doing okay, although my robot here is not, he apparently is not having such a good day as you can hear. <laughs> so... You have robots. Boy, you really are a renaissance man. You are bringing robots into our show. Um, yeah. They well, go on stage with me sometimes and dance around and stuff. They're kind of musical, too, so it's pretty cool. Well, very good. But very yeah, good. I, well, you know, uh, sp- speaking of, of music, um, I'm wondering, you know, in all of this insanity, have we uh, heard from our good friend Eddie Vedder um, in terms of what has happened in the oh, yeah, U.S. Capitol and all that? Uh, no, I haven't heard much about uh, from Eddie lately, uh, so I don't know what he's doing. I know he's kind of a water sports guy like me, so I don't know what he does in the winter, whether he's up at Snoqualmie Pass or Crystal Mountain skiing or something. I'm not sure, but no, I haven't heard much um, from Eddie lately, although there's, you know, a lot of talk, you know, in my in my own personal world, I'm, I'm having a good time because... This is so weird. Like, I went from never being able to find a drummer and wanting to build that drum drum catcher device that drops a cage on them and feeds them Jack Daniels all day or something. But I actually have this drummer now who contacted me and really likes what I'm doing, and he's played with some pretty well-known bands. So I'm like, I'm like really excited about that. And it wasn't me actually auditioning him. It was him pretty much checking in with me and saying, what have you got? And so I just sent him, you know, I sent him that song that you guys have played, Keeping Up With The Joneses, which we're still in the process of releasing, but we got, you know, a, a lot of contractual stuff having to do with distribution on that. But he really liked it. He said, you know, that's solid rock. So I'm looking forward to getting out there. Now, the governor did drop some restrictions in seven counties in Washington State, but we're still at um, only allowing 25% capacity in most businesses. So that makes it really tough for small businesses. And so some folks are still not open yet. Um, But, hey, the Starbucks opened up, you know, near South Lake Union, so something's shaking loose. People aren't going in to have their coffee, but they're definitely standing outside in line to go get it. So, But in Seattle, you know, you can get people to get their coffee. Like I said before, they'll walk miles to get their cup of espresso. But um, it's it's just been a really busy week. Actually, right now... I can imagine. I want to get to some of the notes that you sent me uh, because it, it fits right into, unfortunately... Uh, the tragic uh, scenarios that are developing in the nation's capital with uh, a lunatic congresswoman from Georgia uh, chasing after Cory Bush, uh, you know, um, you know, and, and threats against journalists and so forth. George Stephanopoulos in this case, and uh, I know you had a chance to to meet with um, uh, Senator Cantwell and Senator Murray. Uh, and their staffs, and, and they're outraged as well. Uh, and I know that uh, you were invited to it by Prima Jayapal, the head of the Progressive Caucus in the House. Uh, talk to me a little bit about uh, what occurred there in those uh, conversations. Well, first of all, there uh, we did a podcast for Democracy Watch News, our democracy cast, about the rights of journalists, about these specific issues, about basically how to protect yourself as a journalist, not only from... A crazy extremist, but from the police, because they often targeted uh, journalists. And then we have this story up here where five off-duty Seattle police officers have been identified as being part of uh, the things that happened in Washington, D.C. on January 6th. I don't know if any of them actually tried to break into buildings, but they, they're currently there. And so, you know, we got, we got a lot of issues having to do with journalism. So uh, 
you can also see it on my YouTube channel. It's just called uh, The Rights of Journalists. And it was put together basically by the Committee to Protect Journalists and then the Reuters Thompson Foundation, which is a foundation for freedom of, of the press. Um, but yeah, I was, I, Pramila Jayapal had a town hall, so she called and invited me. Um, and she, of course, is really focused on providing relief to her constituents, I think, um, as, as a congresswoman, that's kind of been her focus. So we got a good briefing on that and what's going on in the state and when we can expect uh, uh, p potential COVID relief checks. And also, you know, there is a shortage of vaccines, unfortunately, and there's also a cover story in the Seattle Times today about how VIPs are getting the, uh, the vaccines first. So there's a lot of questions at local hospitals about, you know, questions of equity. Um, but then there was also, yes, uh, um, a conference call with the staff of uh, Murray and Cantwell's office, and they were both very clear about, um, you know, Murray having been one of the first to call for an impeachment um, during the first impeachment pro proceedings, and then also, you know, having used the word sedition like Jayapal about some of uh, her colleagues in the Congress. Um, she's very angry. That's the the quote that we got from her staff. And then when we asked Maria Cantwell uh, what her uh, official position was on it, the, her staff told us that it was uh, horrified, basically. So both of the Washington State senators uh, are really um, upset and irate about what's going on in the U.S. Congress with some of their colleagues. Like, you know, what was happening uh, today, as we've all been reading about green and uh that whole situation it's just you know out of control so unfortunately um they did admit right up front well first of all they said february 9th this is the senators they said february 9th is the day that the, the uh, inauguration proceedings will start and um so they want to hold trump accountable and they want to hold some of their colleagues accountable but they didn't have any specifics at this point exactly what their plans are what they the first thing they want to do is um, uh, do the impeachment proceeding on February 9th. And then there's also this issue of the COVID relief checks. And unfortunately, and I think you mentioned it earlier on the show today, uh, yeah, they, they're saying mid-March, which is really a shame because you have this whole wave of evictions that's been going on throughout the country. And in, in Seattle, there's an effort by the Seattle City Council for who are also trying to ban the use of tear gas and rubber bullets and flashbang grenades and things on protesters, which, um, which is another issue. I actually ended up giving public testimony on that issue because of my witnessing its misuse oftentimes by police um, to suppress, you know, sometimes protests against police brutality and racism in the police department. So it's a, definitely a conflict of interest, and they have overused it and misused it and put people's lives in danger and included entire areas of Seattle with tear gas for, you know, weeks at a time. Just crazy. Kind of Portland has also had that same problem. So there's a, a move on the Seattle City Council to ban those um, crowd control devices. Um, so I also brought that up um, during the briefing with the senator staff about that. You know, just I just wanted them to know that there's an endemic systematic problem uh, in the police departments across the country. And we we definitely have it in Seattle, such a progressive city. We have a pretty right wing police force. And, yeah, and I guess I what several of them were were uh, ended up uh, being involved in the in the Capitol insurrection as well in the U.S. Uh, Capitol in in D.C. Yes, and one more thing I should mention too: the Seattle does have some legislation that has put a moratorium on evictions in the city, so it has kept um, people that I know from being evicted, and they are looking to extend that. Of course, they're getting a lot of pushback from real estate developers and, you know, landlords, but it's just something that they're trying to do more mass evictions. Meanwhile, there are sweeps of homeless encampments in Seattle. Uh, Jenny Durkin, when I interviewed her when she was running for office, said every person in Seattle deserves to have a place to live, but apparently not if you're in the park with a tent or other public places because uh, police have um, conducted raids. They've also done that. Yesterday, there's a big raid in Bellingham, Washington, which is up near the Canadian border with um, British Columbia. Uh, and, yeah, the, the militarized sheriff's department in dressed like soldiers again, kind of look like some of the Black Lives Matter protests where they show up so militarized they got their armored vehicle and 
all these uh, military-grade surplus weapons and things that were given to them probably free through some very bad legislation passed um, by our U.S. Congress during the drug war, you know, which opened the door to militarizations of police across the country. Um, but, but all in all, you know, my takeaway from the meetings with the, the congressional delegation is that they're very, that they're angry and they're hot under the collar and they don't want to let it go. They're not It doesn't look like, you know, there were a lot of complaints, let's face it, when Barack Obama was elected and he decided not to go after some of the war crimes uh, that George were perpetrated Bush. by the yeah. administration before him. And I don't Interestingly see enough, Congress Cheney, uh, who was a war crimes uh, candidate for jail because of the lies in the Iraq vote, which cost 4,000 lives and over 100,000 Iraqi lives, it was his uh, daughter who actually spoke truth to power and voted with the Democrats and now is being considered a uh, rhino, Republican in name only, and then uh, the Republican lunatic congressman from South Florida, I think it's South Florida, but somewhere in Florida, Matt Gatz, uh, went out to Wyoming me and tried to do it and then Clint Cheney had a pretty good quote uh, you know in saying that um, you know real men uh, don't wear lipstick uh, here in Wyoming which of course Gats had had a lot of makeup on uh, in his uh, in his appearances on TV and everything else you know I mean this this <laughs> This is way out of control when Lynn Cheney is supposedly, you know, a uh, a, a modicum of uh, of of you know sanity. It's <laughs> it's kind of crazy. People really need to push back against this because you have people like Rubio claiming that the impeachment is not about accountability, and he called it merely an act of vengeance by the quote leftist radicals unquote. Yeah. in the Democratic Party. And I haven't seen too many of those, Jeff. I, I, you know, I've been looking for them, but I haven't run into any militant Marxists or anything, yeah. and I'm, I don't think that Senator Cantwell or uh, <laughs> Patty Murray would describe themselves in that way. So this broad brush... Well, ne- neither we, either would AOC or Bernie Sanders as socialists, but yet that doesn't uh, have a Fox News, which I just turned on a few minutes ago, saying uh, socialist support of Joe Biden. Uh, you know, talking about Sanders and AOC. But this is the lies. This is the lies that Limbaugh That's and Hannity and, and the Fox network and, and other networks that have propped up in the last, uh, you know, year or so. Uh, this is what they do. And unfortunately, uh, Americans uh, don't follow politics very much. And if they do, uh, they go to the, the closest, um, you know, TV and in a lot of a lot of hotels, and I've traveled all around the country over the years, and in a lot of places, the only thing you can find is Fox. So that's what has ended up happening. And it's at the same time, it's up to the Democratic Party to knock this down once and for all and to offer something, as I said, a good job at a good wage will tell a Republican to go you know where. Uh, and that's, that's what the Democrats need to do. So go Joe Biden, go in terms of delivering health care for all, delivering... Uh, you know, a fifteen dollar minimum wage and everything else, and good jobs at good wages. In the end, uh, go ahead, Mark. And at the very least, thank goodness that we're not just going to sweep the criminality under the rug this time and pretend it didn't happen, because that was very disappointing for people who actually do believe in justice in this country um, when it happened with the Bush administration. So, uh, thank goodness that uh, my senators and my congresswoman are not going to let it go so easily this time. And that's what should have happened, you know, um, years ago. But uh, people didn't have, apparently, the backbone <laughs> that they've developed now after having deal, to deal with a you know, would-be dictator. So people are finally waking up to the fact that, you know, you have to draw the line. You have to have justice and equity and, um, and uh, due, due process, of course. But also, um, everyone is equal before the law. So, you know, somebody has committed, committed a criminal act just because they're the president... <laughs> It's not going to let them get away with it, okay? This is not Rome. He's not the emperor. He doesn't get to decide what is legal and what is not legal because, you know, he's the, the sole um, arbiter of all, you know, decisions and all power in the land. He is not. He, there are many checks and balances, and we're witnessing right now the results of that. And thank God that we had some people with the foresight that, that founded this country that could look ahead and see the possibility of these things happening and give us some mechanisms to deal with it. And, um, you know, I still think we should get rid of the Electoral College, but, I mean, you've got to support an impeachment process. Um, yeah, because and we can, we can chew gum and walk at the same time. So, Accountability. How can you call yourself uh, a civilized, you know, progressive nation if you, if you don't even believe in justice? You know, 
you have to prove to the world. We have to prove to the world now that uh, you know this is not this is not the norm. What we've experienced the last four years is not the norm. What we saw on January six is not the norm. Okay, people in the United States have been marching in the streets um, for years and years on some of these issues, um, and everyone has the right to protest. But there's a, a certain sentiment that goes along with trying to follow the tenets of a Martin Luther King Jr. or Mahatma Gandhi or Henry David Thoreau when you're talking about nonviolent civil disobedience. That's a totally different thing um, than causing violence and calling for violence and the, the kinds of violent rhetoric that we've seen. It's just unacceptable in uh, a civilized politics. My gosh. I mean, what kind of country are we where we have people <laughs> like calling for uh, violence against our, our leadership. And, you know, it's important, of course, and we've talked about this before, uh, that the press um, be protected because freedom of the press is the very basic tenet of a democracy. Without an uh, educated people, you can't have a democracy. Without a free press, you can't have an educated uh, society. Unfortunately, we have corporate control over a lot of the media, and this is something, you know, that we've talked about before, and I've mentioned to people like Tom Steyer that, you know, there really needs to be a big-time investment in independent and progressive media in this country. And until that happens, uh, and by the way, I guess uh, Tom Hartman wrote an article in The Nation a couple of months ago in December, early December, about this, where, you know, the people um, on the other side of the spectrum who aren't funded by Fox News or aren't funding Fox News and Sinclair Broadcasting and a lot of the more right-wing um, broadcast media the people on the other side of the spectrum really need to learn to get it together and fund that kind of media. Otherwise, there's going to be a big hole. Um, well, there has been. It's like kind of 400 to 1 States. on radio. <laughs> I can tell you that. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we're, uh, we, and I say we on the progressive side, you know, are uh, limited. Now, more so on the Internet. But, you know, it's, it's uh, very, very few and far between. Uh, and, uh, and it was worse. Uh, you know, it was worse before Air America in 2003 and four, and it's got worse since Air America and others uh, have died. So um, it's, uh, it's, it's, but, you know, there is hopefully uh, at the end of the rainbow, and we hope to be part of, uh, part of that solution uh, in the coming weeks. Uh, let me ask you this, Mark. I think that for a lot of people, um, they look at, uh, Washington State and Seattle, and, and in particular, you know, as as a real progressive beacon. And I'm thinking about Jayapal here. You know, I hope that you know whether Cantwell and Murray want to retire, or you know, maybe Inslee decides to not run. I I think that Jayapal has really proven her her medal here. She's now taken over away from uh, the uh, Wisconsin um, Mr. Pocan. I don't think is is very effective in leadership. She's now the sole leader, and I think that her next step is to run statewide. I don't know if if you know anything you want to say on the air now, but. I would love to see her become the next senator or maybe even the next governor if Inslee wants to step aside. Inslee's been in government, you know, for years and all over government. So I, I just think that that, to me, would be interesting. Uh, I don't know what you know, but I, I would hope that uh, she has the ability to take the next step. Well, I've been thinking about that there are some political opportunities um, in Washington State, uh, both um, the governor's office in the Senate, and uh, also uh, the mayorship of Seattle, um, because there's there's the political spectrum has changed. I think over the last couple of years, and people are demanding change, and I don't see that change coming from the, the conservative side or the or the right wing. So probably it's going to come from the more progressive folks like Nikita Oliver, who I've mentioned before. Um, uh, I see her as, as uh, a very, very possible bid, um, likely bid for mayor um, this coming year against Jenny Durkin, who's already uh, let everybody know that she's not running again. Now, I don't know whether she has aspirations for a higher office, but mm, she's a pretty controversial figure in Seattle. Uh, everybody finds a reason not to like what she does. The, the conservatives, of course, don't like her because they think that she's a socialist or something, but then people who are, who are civil rights activists actually don't like the fact that she uses the police department as her kind of personal armed force sometimes to clear protests yeah, and, exactly. and homeless encampments. So she gets criticism from both sides. 
Um, Governor Inslee is pretty popular, um, so, you know, he, he won handily. Pramila Jayapal is extremely popular. So there's always this issue of do we want to let um, this person go from this position in order to cover another one when they're doing such a great job in representing their constituency? And I'd say, you know, Pramila Jayapal is, is the perfect person for this, this congressional district and is, has really pushed Jim McDermott's legacy, the 14-term Congress um, member, yes. really pushed his legacy way beyond even his own progressive platform. I mean, she's gone way beyond that. She's such a progressive fighter and has brought so much energy. And as a part of this whole cadre of, of women of color that have just, just been kicking butt all over on the Seattle City Council, you know, in the Congress, um, uh, in the state house, so she's you know definitely this new this represents this vanguard of of people, and it's it's good to see somebody that you know has the best interests of the people in mind. You know, she's certainly not a very not a self serving sort of politician, and Cantwell and Marie have been uh, criticized at times by progressives in the state for not being on the forefront. They were both for the Iraq War, which you know we were talking about a little bit ago, so. They have some marks against them, and possibly, you know, may not represent, do not represent the most progressive side of the party. But in the in this particular case of trying to hold um, the Republicans accountable, they seem to be up, up out front. And I know Cantwell was out front on things like um, uh, internet um, issues, you know, some high tech issues that a lot of other senators hadn't been able to grasp yet, like. Uh, net neutrality and things like that. In the meantime, we, you know, I'm waiting for the music to come back, and my friend over here has got a guitar, and he wanted to play this. Yeah, I know. We just got a couple of minutes here. I, I can, I can hear it in the background. Um, well, let me, let me ask you bef- before we roll. Um, is there, is there hope to, um, to see more? Uh, opportunities of maybe outside. I know we're still a couple of months away from spring, and I don't know when Seattle actually, you know, looks at spring, <laughs> maybe June. But um, is there a hope that, you know, maybe you and some of your bandmates can play on top of a rooftop or, uh, you know, you can you can be safe but yet be outside? Are any of those discussions underway from, you know, city officials? I know you're, you're talking about the Mayor Durkin, who we've spoke about. But is that at all under consideration? Well, we know that the iconic clubs of Crocodile and the Rebar are going to survive, but they're moving to South Seattle. But as far as outdoor festivals, nobody has mentioned anything to me about Bumbershoot, and I haven't seen anything in the local media. So I think everybody well, is... Well, that's August, not, right? Yeah. And, you know, Seattle well, is not that Maybe bad we can push it back to, like, September, maybe. There's well, some hope for September, think- according to Fauci. Yeah, and my hope is that, at, and all I can tell you is that people in Seattle are incredibly resilient, and the music here is incredibly resilient. So you give people an opportunity um, to do any kind of an outdoor event, even if it's got limited capacity, and, you know, everyone will show up. It's People really want to gather right now um, and see live music. So it'll happen somehow, Jeff, and as soon as the governor list the restrictions enough for the rock clubs to open up again, I think this town will be hopping. I mean, there will be so many people who have waited so long, you know, to hear their favorite band that it's going to be a huge celebration. And people are very uh, serious about supporting the music here. So uh, you'll get, you'll see a big effort by the musicians themselves, I think. We're still doing remote yeah. Uh, live stream concerts and things like that, even at some well, of the venues. That's good. And at least that, that gives you something to look forward to, uh, Mark, and I think that's an important piece. Yeah. Hey, we got to run, my man. Uh, you take care of yourself. Be safe there in uh, Seattle in the 206. We will uh, talk to you next week. Always a pleasure, Jeff. You and Ron, take care. Have a great weekend. Uh, enjoy it, man. Enjoy your weekend, and again, be safe out there in the 206. Uh, folks, uh, it's the end of the week and uh, and the end of the month as well. We'll be back in February to talk to you, uh, God willing, and the uh, sunshine and all that stuff. Um, we are, um, you know, going to be uh, uh, talking to you uh, about a number of issues. Liz Schuler of the AFL-CIO will be joining us on Wednesday. Uh, we'll also be hearing from Ed Whitkin, formerly of the AFL-CIO, and uh, many other new guests as well. Keep on fighting, folks, peacefully. Have yourself a great weekend. 
My name is Jeff Santos. I want to thank Ron Kreider for producing this broadcast. Enjoy it, folks. My name is Jeff Santos, and I got to go. It is hour two of the Jeff Santos Show, and welcome to it, folks. I'm going to be talking with uh, Mac Fritchman of the Committee to Preserve Social Security and Medicare a little bit later this hour. But uh, if it's 4 o'clock and it's Thursday afternoon on the Jeff Santos Show, you know we're going to Harlem, New York. You know we're going to speak to the great uh, journalist from the Amsterdam News, the great professor from uh, City College uh, in Harlem, and, and of course, uh, the great author and can, many great books. Go to Amazon.com and find out a lot more about Black Detroit, one of the latest uh, books that Mr. Uh, Herb Boyd has authored. Uh, Herb, happy Thursday, my friend. Uh, how are you? Herb, can you hear me? You are. are you? you are, Ron. You okay? I'm, I'm doing well. How are you? <laughs> okay. <laughs> A little hesitancy there. I say we had to double check. You get, no, the, no. Uh, bar- <laughs> get the barometer, the thermometer, see what's happening. <laughs> yes. Well, I will, speaking of barometers... <laughs> um, you know, and take it, take in the temperature. You know, we, we've talked to you for, for four years now, and, and mm-hmm. obviously you were like a lot of people. We just spoke to, uh, you're a good friend of mine, a native, uh, uh, fellow New Yorker, uh, Rona Freed, for, we haven't talked to her in a couple of months, and we were, mm-hmm. uh, rejoicing, literally using the term hallelujah, uh, to be speaking of Joe Biden. He's now six days in, and I talked <laughs> to a lot of progressives, our, our, our good friend and, and fellow journalist, John Nichols. Uh, he said, look, you talked to the Nation magazine, you know, a magazine that's been very critical of, of both Democrat and Republican presidents. He goes, there was nothing critical uh, to be about Joe Biden over the first six days uh, of his presidency. And, and, and that, to me, you know, says a lot. And uh, as somebody who has also been critical and was not, you know, Joe Biden was probably my fifth choice going into the primaries. Um, you know, I think he's off to a very good start. Uh, what say you from your perch in New York City? I was talking to uh, my wife about it, you know, and she said, huh, any, any Daisy May or Mickey Mouse would, <laughs> would, have, would have been a change, any, any kind of change from Trump. <laughs> <you know? laughs> That's true. But I think he's, I think he's, he's, he's exceeded even, even, uh, even the great mouse. Yeah. That's for sure. Exactly. But I think one of the things about this, and it's certainly um, very, very uh, promising, He's living up to some of the things that he promised during his campaign and uh, in his uh, first inaugural address. I say first, maybe he'll get two. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. anyway, it's, it's so good to see that the executive order sees uh, his pen is poised. He's striking with uh, with the kind of um, optimism and, and the uplifting that is just so diametrically opposed to the previous four years. So I think anybody who's suggesting that uh, any kind of uh, a loony tune would be an improvement over uh, Trump, that's a good point. But obviously we don't have a loony tune in the Oval Office now. You know, we right. got someone there who is, has exhibited uh, compassion, he exhibited decency, he's got a certain amount of honesty and integrity about him, and he's, he's, he's making the mo- right moves right now, Jeff, in terms of um, the immigration situation, to say nothing of what he's had to say about the pandemic and getting additional dosages, which is so vitally needed, you know, and those numbers are spiraling all over the place. I was looking at a map this, uh, this morning, and my goodness, you know, it's like, no place. They had two or, little, two or three little spots on the dot where you can go, and there's not an increase in the uh, coronavirus. So for him to say an increased dosage, uh, for him to take a position on climate change and pushing that forward, the Paris Accords, all the foreign policy, uh, the infrastructure, Come on, Joe. Keep you keep the. Uh, I say he's putting the pe- he's putting the pedal to the metal, and uh, keep it right there. I agree. And, uh, don't, don't don't take your foot off because we got a lot of people to drive that. <laughs> oh, we uh, keep his foot to the fire if you take it off. <laughs> exactly. You got that right too, my friend. Uh, we 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 we've been uh, we've been uh, bamboozled in the past, so oh, we brother. don't we, we we don't need to uh, we don't need to lay it down yet. But I I am excited, and mm. um, you know, as as a progressive. Uh, as uh, somebody who understands of all the concerns in the world, and I want to address one of them that he touched on a couple of days ago, and that is the issue of prison reform. 
Mm -hmm. Well, look, we have talked about this for a long time, uh, Herb, uh, between the police Mm -hmm. violence and the violence that occurs, you know, when when somebody is thrown into jail, uh, you know, for, uh, you know, not paying their parking tickets or speeding tickets. Uh, That's what the whole Ferguson thing was about. Um, You know, you we all know about, uh, you know, the scenarios of uh, what happened in the 80s and 90s uh, with people possession of marijuana. You're white. You know, you get a slap on the wrist and you go home. Uh, you go into mm-hmm. jail uh, for the same amount of uh, same amount of uh, cocaine or or crack. So there's a whole slew of differences, and and I'm glad that he is addressing them because these are things that we need to uh, really be focused on going forward. This is kind of a semi atonement too, because you have to confess and admit that uh, he was part of the problem. That's right. And his crime bill oh, in on the, on the crime bill, exactly. So, okay, fine. You know, let's go back. And you can't undo, uh, at least improve our situation when it comes to policing and law reform and police, police brutality and what have you in this country. And he seems to have a grip on that. And, and uh, of course, you know, Kamala, she has a similar kind of uh, stain on her past when it comes to the, the imprisonment of uh, black men in this in this society. So let's see if they truly step up to the plate and, and, and do something about remedying a situation where our prison load is just out of off the charts. To say nothing of how the corporate how corporations have taken full advantage of that in terms of having these uh, these these inmates. You know, work for nothing. They're slave labor. I mean, they don't even get. They can get nothing at all, and they're producing products out there. And of course, Biden has said something about that relationship between these corporations and and and, and the prisoners. And that's all good. Let's keep it going. You know, you got so, so much to undo. Is I mean, the damage done by the last four years, and we've said this before, Jeff. It'll take more than. A hundred days. It'll take more than four years to rectify and, and, and improve a situation. The chipping away of the Obama Biden legacy. He's trying to put some of those things back in place. When it comes to affordable health care, when you talk about uh, doing something about the unemployment situation in this country, and of course putting people to work. And talk about fifteen dollars an hour increase. I mean, that's got that's monumental right there. Yeah, no, I mean, look, the the $15 minimum wage, and we have uh, somebody on our show on Friday, and we're going to have to tag team you with him one of these days, Joe Sandberg, who's been calling for a, a $25 minimum wage uh, perspective. <laughs> and and he, he looks at it from the reality, and if you think about this, Herb, uh, you know, it, if we were to continue it in 1961 through the Kennedy and Johnson administration, we all know what happened to Johnson during Vietnam, and the whole Democratic mm-hmm. Party and the whole country went to hell in a handbasket from then, uh, um, you know, we would have been already at 25. And, you know, mm-hmm. we shouldn't be, oh, well, we got to stay at 15. We got 15. We got to do that for the next 10 years. No. Let's add it up. Let's go to 18. Let's go to 20. And really, in a place like where you live in New York or Los Angeles, San Francisco, you know, very expensive places to live, mm-hmm. why not have it at 20? You know, make the exception. And, you know, I just think that, you know, these are things that we need to start doing if we want to raise all boats, quote unquote, right? No doubt about it. I mean, but we have to understand the gradualism, how things are done incrementally in this society. Right. And, and you know, even when you're looking at the situation with this impeachment and the possible censure, you know, we're saying the filibuster, we still got some major issues, some major obstacles to deal with, oh, yeah. a lot of residue. A lot of the uh, vintage and leftovers from slavery, uh, you look at the filibuster, the electoral college, you know, you look at the runoff elections, all those things, you say, look here, part of the 400 years of oppression for African American people in particular in this society. So we've got now four years to work with. How much we can chip away from the meanness you know, particularly the most immediate for last four years, kind of mean-spirited damn devastation that he just uh, he leveled off just about every every factor of our society it was impacted by some kind of devastating policy coming from the Trump administration. So, if Biden and 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 Harris, if they do no more than correcting some of the damage of the last four years, 
that'll be that'll be so vastly appreciated by people who have been suffering under the tyranny of the Trump administration. So let's get to it. I mean, people are not talking about he's moving too fast with these executive orders. He can't move fast enough for me. Oh, exactly. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, if you want to throw out 35 a day, I'm all for it. Believe me, man. Uh, sure. You know, it, it, it is it is all good. All good, my friend. Uh, the phone number to join us, 772-223-2362. We have uh, full phone lines for you, Herb. Uh, and mm-hmm. uh, we want to uh, go to our good friend Mark in San Francisco in a minute, then uh, good friend Wayne in Chicago, Rudy in Chicago, oh, and Stephen in California. So uh, I'm going to uh, start here. Uh, just one more thing. I think that there is sure. a, a real real need here for all of us to sort of uh, understand that uh, it, it continue to put the pressure on Biden and the administration as a whole. But I think we can uh, we can do a lot here. All right. Let's go to San Francisco. We'll talk to our good friend, Mark. Uh, you are uh, first with Herb Boyd. Go right ahead. Yeah, Herb and Jeff, uh, one of my concerns is uh, we're going to be running up against uh, even harder uh, voter suppression laws. To deal with, and uh, we've got to make sure that this administration uh, pushes forward um, uh, voting rights in this country that makes it accessible for everybody to be able to vote. Uh, the Republicans are going to go uh, really strong at at uh, restricting uh, people of color, especially, to vote. So we have to watch out for that. And then my other concern is the truth. Um, we need the truth in this country. Uh, this uh, Marjorie uh, Taylor Green, uh, who's the new face of the Republican Party. Uh, mm-hmm. who's, who's a liar, uh, who's somebody that uh, also pushed for the lie that, um, you know, this, this election was stolen from Trump. Uh, everybody associated with that lie, uh, from uh, Howley and, and Cruz, uh, from Trump to Fox News to Hannity to the rest of the right-wing hate radio, we, we got to demand the truth and accountability. If we don't, then we're going to be looking at uh, a coup next time around if they don't win. So those are my concerns, Herb, and uh, hopefully we we'll all work together to to stop this from happening. No doubt, no doubt, uh, Herb. <laughs> He, certainly, Mark, you're spot on. One of the things that uh, we're certainly concerned about voter suppression, and with the 2022 elections, I think we'll get a solid indication of where we are with this, particularly where the uh, Trump legacy is. And a lot of these uh, complicit Republicans, GOP members, who still believe that the the election was stolen from him, you know, they'll see whether or not the... Exactly. You know, whether that these, this thing has any impact, whether it, it, Trumpism still has some, uh, some residents out there. And certainly you're right about, uh, you know, dealing with equity in this society. I mean, you know, uh, he said something about that uh, in terms of uh, Biden taking a move right away. I mean, he mentioned, even in his inaugural address, when you can have like a president even shake their mouth to say systemic racism, I mean that's got to be a vast improvement right there. Uh, no doubt, no doubt. Uh, mm-hmm. Thank you. Go ahead, Mark. You got you got ten seconds. You yeah, got another call. I did, mm-hmm. Yeah, what I what I what I wanted to say was, you know, basically that uh, we we have to be vigilant. I I really think, and I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I really think that Trump planned and initiated that action. Um, on the sixth, I really do. I think he set that up. I think oh, I have no doubt <laughs> we'll discover. And, I, and, and that's there, why there he are people to be impeached. The, mm. He needs no, to be impeached, the, Jeff. I agree 100 percent. This idea, and I'm glad you brought it up yesterday, that Tim Kaine is bringing out with censure is a non-starter with me. They should put him, you know, with a with a muzzle in the corner and say, uh, "Tim, wake up. We're not in 1994 anymore. Uh, you know, get get out of uh, get out of the Senate if you can't play hardball, because uh, that's what we're dealing with. And these folks are going to try to do it again. Look, they're bringing guns into the Senate floor, Herb. I mean, you know, in the House mm-hmm. floor. So I mean, you know, he, this is no time to play games. I mean, AOC, uh, you know, uh, Hakeem Jeffries. The other day, his uh, his relatives, uh, brother, uh, you know, somebody had called them and said they were outside of his home, uh, threatening him. So I mean, you know, we're we're playing here with 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 people who don't value human life. And if if we have to have you know restrictions that bar people for life, too bad. You know, I mean, you know, you cannot uh, you know live in a uh, in a civilized society and behave like uh, they're cavemen. So um, that's the way it is. So thank you, Mark, for the call. And that's another concern that that uh, 
Mark is concerned about uh, voter suppression. We're concerned about the uh, the rise of this the right wing in this in this nation. And I mean, Trump gave them a full leeway. I mean, he got a full pass, you know, to go ahead and do whatever they want to do. The Oath Keepers, you know, the Wolverines out of Michigan who were going to plan the kidnapping of Governor Whitmer there. Right. The whole Proud Boys, the Three Percenters. Boogaloo. I mean, oh, yeah. today on, on, we on. cover with a different organization, a different affiliate, a different group of uh, people, of particularly angry white men in this country. So it's very much a concern as we go into these uh, divide and Harris years because these people are absolutely incensed by the change of government. Uh, for sure. Let's go to continue in California, go further west to talk to our good friend Stephen. Uh, you're next with Herb Boyd. Go ahead, Stephen. Oh, what a pleasure to speak with you. I did what you're saying, Herb. Um, just a mm-hmm. couple of things. Um, I was listening. I don't know who I was listening to, but I, I heard that the case against Brother Malcolm was go- was thinking about being reopened. Have you heard anything about that? Oh, certainly. You know, I've been very much a part of that. Uh, we recently uh, had a documentary on who killed Malcolm X, and right. that question was raised then, and much of that... Uh, the whole documentary uh, was uh, pretty much promulgated by the by the opening of the case again, but that still hasn't been fully completed. I mean, it's still pretty much on the table, but certainly just to have a few of these DAs around the country talking about it, that's, that's a step in the right direction. Okay, cool. Yeah. And two more things mm-hmm. I'll leave you with. <clears throat> in terms of um, incrementalists, uh, and when it comes to the... Um, Minimum wage, we can't wait to 2025. By the time it goes to 15, it'll be equal to $5. Congress allows themselves a wage increase, no problem. And number three, <laughs> what's, your, what's your choice? Your, are you temptations or dramatic? <laughs> <laughs> well, me, me, I'm, I'm smoky, boy. I'm a smoky Robinson, you know, oh. in the miracles. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I, like, I like smoky. All right, cool. Thanks, yeah, man. It was nice talking with you thank, thank you, you steven <laughs> uh i'm a temptations guy myself so uh very good Uh-oh, I uh heard that. <laughs> thank you steven um all right let's go to chicago and talk to our good friend rudy uh somehow we've lost wayne uh let's go to uh the great city mm. of chicago hello rudy you're next with her boy yeah hi fellas uh i regardless of what the uh congress does regarding uh trump I think the city of Washington, D.C. ought to press charges in their court. He was inside of the riot. He was part of the riot. Five people died. You could call it murder, and he's involved with that. As I understand it, in those jurisdictions, if you're involved with a group that commits a crime and someone dies or is killed, you're equally responsible. Yeah. Yeah, he, he's not part of the conspiracy complicit. to murder. They're complicit. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, how about that? I'm, I'm all is for it. I, I think we, whatever, whatever <laughs> we can do, and I know that you have an attorney general there and Miss James who's also ready uh, to start, uh, you know, putting some requests in to, for Mr. Uh, Trump to uh, go to court as well, right, Herb? Exactly, because what they're saying is that uh, it's it's kind of DOA. The whole impe- impeachment is DOA. It's dead on arrival. Uh, yeah. it, the, the Republicans uh, doing the jury, swearing, swearing in of jurors, indicated that you don't have the numbers there. So that's just out, out the uh, should be taken off the table. But what well, I don't know about taking off the table. But I understand we got to look at different options. But censure is not yeah, one of Trish them. James, Trish uh, certainly. She'll pick up the ball later. And there's a number of those uh, uh, violations and crimes that he's commit, committed that he can be convicted on, and she's going to bring them all to bear. You watch. I, and, I mm-hmm. would bet to get a guilty verdict in Washington, D.C. on him. Yeah, 
I'm all for it. I mean, however, we sure. can construe this. I mean, you know, th- this is the thing. Mm. Be creative, Democrats. Don't take your don't take your foot off the pedal, and and make sure that Mr. <laughs> Trump can never run for president again. There is another there is another discussion, you know, about uh, if they don't get the conviction of the 67 uh, senators, which you need 17. Look, you got five, mm. so you need what another another uh, 12 or whatever. So you know, it's not mm. that far fetched. But if you don't get it. Put the pressure on McConnell. I mean, McConnell has to be involved in, in, in some of these conversations over the last couple of weeks. You know, bring up Mike Pence, you know, before, before <laughs> trial. You know, I, I want to know what he knows. I mean, I, I say push all the buttons you can. We can walk, we can uh, do all the legislative issues, too. We can walk and chew gum at the same time. Even if you're convicted in the Senate, charge them in Washington, too. Yeah, no, I agree with you, Rudy. I agree with you. Uh, you know, whatever we could do. Uh, you know. Attorney General Rudy. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah, let's make you assistant attorney general, uh, Rudy. I would do it. I know you would. <laughs> You're our best man. Thank you. Well, Thank you, know, you Rudy. Look, yeah, he, he, uh, he gets it, you know, and I, I think that, you know, all of the issues, and we're going to do a lot more. Uh, you know, between the connection of FDR to MLK. We've been doing a lot on MLK over the last uh, few days, a few weeks. And, you know, some of the things that he was talking about, you know, back in 1967, we're playing a, an interview uh, done with Sander Van Oker of NBC News. And he was talking mm-hmm. about the poverty in the South and the poverty in the North uh, and, and about the racism, you know, is a little different than the civil rights marches of the, of the South and so forth. He said, uh, priority would be to definitely take the cap off. I don't know if you want to go 400000 or or more. Medicare, because they assume that's covered by Medicare, and it is not. Exactly. Um, so those benefits need to... That's the Medicare. Rudy, you're next with Max Richmond. Go right ahead. Yeah, how do you do? Uh, a few years ago, before uh, Senator Sanders was a candidate for the presidency, I had the opportunity to talk with him on one of the uh, talk shows in Chicago. And I brought up expanding uh, benefits in Social Security. And I cited dental and vision. And he was 100% for it. So he's well aware that this needs to be done. And if you, if you give seniors the dental benefit, this will decrease the risk of illness. A lot right. of illnesses come from bad uh, dental hygiene. So uh, that's just an idea that's got uh, a lot of value to it, and I hope he brings it up at uh, this administration. Couldn't couldn't agree with you more. Go ahead, Max. Well, uh, you know, Rudy is is very fortunate to have an opportunity to have uh, connected with Senator Sanders. Senator Sanders. Uh, there is not a, a member of Congress who has had a longer, more consistent uh, uh, positions on Social Security and Medicare, improving both of those programs. He's been a champion for for decades. I I went to Vermont with him when he was still a member of the House of Representatives, and uh, he say he's saying the same things now. The same things he said when he ran for president in 2016 and and this time around, he's saying the same things he's been saying since back then. The only difference is a lot more people are listening, and I think a lot more people will be paying attention, not just Rudy, but a lot of people. Yeah, I, I, I think uh, I think that Rudy is just an example of so many people who, you yeah. know, uh, understand that Bernie is one of the few uh, legislators, uh, not the only one, but a few that are actually fighting for the working class and that's uh, and the middle class as a whole. And you then know, we need to, to have def- more champions. 